Hello, welcome. Uh, let's get started. Um, so um, this is going on on YouTube. Uh, in case you you miss the stream, the whole point is, <clears throat> you know, to teach people uh, some concept on computer science. Um, hopefully, you'll you'll learn how to program. You'll you'll get good content. Uh, from what it would otherwise be like a computer science class in a in a prestigious university and so I am following a curriculum of um, you know some online courses on some Ivy League universities let's just let's just put it that way and I am distilling about two one-hour classes uh, for one hour of uh, basically my my stream uh, which I think is pretty good so you're getting a condensed version of what you would get in a computer science uh, class from again from Ivy League schools um, <clears throat> today we're gonna go over I'm gonna bombard you with some uh, some theory uh, some some concepts so bear with me on that I think they're important again I'm following the curriculum of, of computer science course in a Ivy League school so this is kind of like what you would see there as well and <clears throat> so uh, you know we're gonna do a little bit of programming but most of it is gonna be theory so again this is going on YouTube for you to watch it and rewatch it as um, as you try to learn these concepts all right <clears throat> so last time I owed you um, you know we we're seeing the the first computer bug and it was actually like a, a piece of paper with like a moth taped onto it uh, the person that reported that bug was uh, Grace Hopper Dr. Grace Hopper you can see her picture here I owed you her name last time pioneer of computer programming invented one of the first linkers and we're gonna see in this in this stream what a linker is um, <clears throat> but um, you know the 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 word bug didn't start with you know just that moth per se right that was just kind of a coincidence Thomas Edison reported bugs in his designs as early as early as the 1800s um, uh, also the computer that uh, Grace Hopper was working on that I, I said that they crawled in and found the moth that was the uh, mark II at Harvard University around 1947 Right. So that's some information that I owed you last time. <clears throat> and, and with that, again, history of computing, this, this is important. So my goal is to teach you a formal computer science course. The benefits are like, number one, you don't have to pay for, for it. Um, it would be pretty expensive, especially in one of these Ivy League schools, right? Um, and, and number two, because it's, it's important for people to have the context, right? You, you might think, well, you know, I just want to learn how to program. But, like, theory gives you some, some context, right? And history of computing gives you some, some context. And one of the things that I feel sad about these days is that a lot of programmers, and I mean a lot, maybe the majority, don't have that context and it's not that I expect everyone to have a formal computer science degree but you know it, it I, I think this is important let's just put it that way all right so very quickly uh, first computing device the abacus about 4,000 years ago really uh, that's when you know computer doesn't mean oh it's like a laptop or a desktop that we um, you know nowadays nowadays think of really computing the word computing has we've been computing for you know long long time in the 1800s uh, Charles Babbage was a Lucasian chair in Cambridge England um, <clears throat> he designed the uh, difference engine and analytical engine and this was a computer um, that started not as a physical thing but as like a, a theory thing and there's actually a branch of computer science that's um, um, automata I, I want to say yeah, theory of automata and it's just like you know you draw on piece of paper 
these theories basically and you know you don't need a physical computer right it's all mathematical almost it almost feels mathematical <clears throat> and so that's what Charles Babbage kind of designed if you will this difference engine and analytical engine it was more theory based and mathematical based right and so related to that the first programmer was Ada Byron uh, which devised various programs for uh, Charles numerical engine and again this wasn't like a physical machine it was just a theoretical machine more or less right in the 1930s and 40s uh, the first prototype of electromechanical computers and the word mechanical is you know you have to imagine it wasn't just electronical um, and then on the 1946 we, we saw the first uh, basically the first modern computer if you can call it that right and it was called the ENIAC electron electronic numerical integrator and computer right and it was you know kind of like the name says that it was more for mathematical calculation so to speak and then we go all the way to 1971 and we see the first microprocessors and that kind of got us started with what we know today as computers and uh, you know smartphones and tablets and all that good stuff right so this stuff is important but I mean we're not gonna see it ad nauseum um, we're just you know it's just here because it's important it's part of a formal computer science degree and it doesn't take that long okay <clears throat> all right just to be clear definition of computer science uh, study of problem solving uh, with computers right uh, basically that that's it right um, it's called science for a reason but I, I, I want to I want you to pay attention to the word or the words problem solving here because that's the way I look at it right and um, computers a, a computer program is more or less like a puzzle that you need to solve right you have a problem and you need to think about how am I gonna solve that problem right that's what this is about it's not about writing code the writing the code is comes after you start thinking what do I need to do to solve this problem right and so it's not only what do I need to do it's like what do I need to do so that the computer understands me when I tell it what I want it to do right and so with that um, I have an interesting um, thing in here that we were doing last time remember the little Minecraft that we were doing last time in, in code.org um, so I was I was doing this this is like uh, section 7 and what you need to do in here remember this is kinda like the code that we need to put in here um, it says uh, it's good to plan ahead plan crops on both sides of the water so you don't get hungry later on right so you gotta stop and think about it for a minute and I found myself rushing through it and making mistakes in other words making bugs in the code right but the point I'm trying to make in here is like this is almost like a puzzle right what do I need to do I need to plant crops on this side and then I kinda like need to walk over to the other side and then plant crops on this side right so let's just try it together so what do I need to do so I'm, I'm, I'm on the dirt so I probably and I need to do it several times so I have a repeat loop remember last time we saw four loops one two three four five six so the six is fine I don't need to change the six and I want to plant crop right let's just run that all right so obviously that was wrong you see and this is what I'm saying you know if you kinda rush through it and don't think about it hard you need to reset the program and try it over right but no matter how good of a thinker you are or, or how good of a puzzle server solver more likely than not you will find yourself you know trying something out and then running it and then it doesn't work and then you change the program and you run it again and it doesn't work and then you run it again and so on and so forth right and so that's a process of debugging right? we call that debugging and you just saw like I tried to rush through it and I thought it was gonna plant the crop six times but it didn't plant the crop six times right or maybe it did but it planted the crop on on the same spot so now what I need to do is after planting the crop I need to move forward right let's try that let's reset it 
and run it again. All right, now it's kind of doing this the, the right thing, right? Okay, all right. So it did that part right, right? So now I need to turn right, I think. Turn right, and then like move forward two steps, right? And maybe uh, do another repeat six times, right? And then plant crops, and then move forward again six times, right? And let's see what that does. Run again. Whoops, what happened? Oh, okay. So I did this inside the loop, right? So I planted one crop move forward one space, we turn right and then move forward and we're in the water, right? So again, you know, this is about debugging, right? Seeing where you did things wrong. So the move forward actually comes after the loop, right? So I move forward and then I move forward and then I can repeat and plan my crops again, right? And then the turn right, it's also after the loop. All right, let's reset it and run again. All right, so now it's doing... Yep, another bug, right? Did you see that? It went this way instead of moving right, and it's planting crops now on this spot, right? So what did I do wrong, right? So it planted all these six crops, great, right? And then we turn right, we move to two steps but I forgot to turn right again you see so I forgot to turn right again down here right and if I turn right right again now I can plan plant another six crops okay let's try that uh, oh okay so what happened? I'm missing one. One, two, three, four, five. Why didn't I plant six crops? Oh, okay. I know what happened, right? I planted a crop here, right? And this is important because we're going to see this. Um, this is what is called an OBOB. And uh, to be honest with you, I hadn't heard that term until I attended one of these Ivy League classes. <laughs> And an OBOB is off by one uh, bug, O-B-O-B, -B, right? So I'm off by one in here, right? I didn't plant a crop here, but, but I think what happened is I, you know, I planted these six crops over here, right? And then I turn right over here. I advance two steps. I turn right again, right? But then I didn't move forward. So I started planting the crop on this square up here instead of moving to the dirt okay so I need another move forward I'm off by one right and then I can plant six crops let's reset and run now I started in the right place and I am no longer off by one okay and then puzzle, com and it's even, it even says in here, puzzle completed. So with this, what I wanted to show you is what we just did, that is programming right there, right? That is programming, that is debugging, that is problem solving, that is solving a puzzle with code. That is what programming is about, right? So I, I really encourage you to, you know, just come in here and practice these puzzles. They're, they're kind of like games, if you think about it, right? They're, they're made for kids, but you can really get a lot uh, out of them. Um, you can certainly get a lot out of them, for sure. Okay. All right. That's what programming is about. Okay, let's move back to here. Program is a puzzle. All righty. We did Minecraft, so common errors, off by one bug, right? I didn't do that on purpose, as a matter of fact, but I just showed you off by one bug, the OBOB, okay? Um, sometimes when you're looping, that happens a lot because you 
get out of the loop or you either start early or don't do don't do enough um, uh, iterations right um, just to show you in code real quick last time we were seeing some code um, so for example we had a while loop in you know maybe a for loop right so maybe I'm doing a for loop and then you know, just for the sake of example I'm gonna plant the crop in here right but uh, maybe after I get out of this loop I need to either move forward one more time or plan one more crop right so that's the obob you know so sometimes I get out of the loop and I need to plant an extra crop right it just depends on what the puzzle in front of you is but this obop off by one bug is very common, right? Especially before or after loops, right? So this one, for example, while not in the file, then maybe I have a read line in file in here, right? But, um, <clears throat> well, this is not a good example, but, you know, sometimes maybe I wanted to read extra characters in the file or something like that, right? So after the loop, I need to do something else or maybe close the file, right? close the file right something like that right so something where the iteration is not enough and you need to do extra steps outside of the loop that's usually what we refer to by by obop um, another common error is the infinite loop and we kind of got into that last time right so infinite loop is when you have a while loop especially a while loop right a for loop will never be infinite um, well, it, it can be infinite, but it's harder for it to be infinite. But maybe this one was, for example, I can say in here, maybe let uh, j equals minus 1. Um, and then in here, I'm going to say j equals to j minus 1. Right, so it'll start as minus 1 and then it'll go minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, right? We're subtracting 1, right? And then in here I can say while j is less than 3, right? Well, this loop is going to be infinite, right? Because j is always going to be less than 3. It'll never be greater than or equal to 3, right? Because I started at minus 1, or I can start at 0, for example, right? But I'm decrementing. Right, so it'll go 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, all the way up to minus infinity, right? And it, this condition will never be false, which means I'm going to keep looping. I'm going to keep doing whatever is inside these two curly braces forever, right? That's what we call an infinite loop, right? So you got to be careful where that your condition to break out of the loop so just go back to the loop again so while this is true we're gonna be executing this but we don't want to be executing this forever right so in order to break out of this loop this condition needs to be false right so I gotta make sure for example to increment instead of decrement right and then at some point j is gonna be equal to 3 or greater than 3 in which case we're gonna break out of the loop that's what you want to do you want to break out of the loop at some point you don't want an infinite loop. Infinite loops are bad. That's another common bug, right? Common error in computing. All right, so <clears throat> last time, more software engineering uh, comments and good names. So last time we were doing this in my first program, right? But what I didn't show you was when we said move forward, there was some code running in the background, right? Um, and I didn't show you what that what this was. We just said, okay, they're kind of commands, right? And they look like this. So move forward, and then you open parentheses, you close parentheses, right? And this is our main function, which we said it's our, our starting point for our uh, program, right? And you know, it's everything is inside this curly brace, uh, curly braces. And, yet, and then you have some indentation to make sure you know uh, it's easier to read so everything indented inside these curly braces means it belongs inside those curly braces just like this one right these two are indented so this is indented with respect to the main function 
but this is indented with respect to the for loop and so on and so forth <coughs> right so you some indentation makes it easier to read um, but I didn't show you what you know what what's behind the curtain on this right so now I'm going to show you right it's a bunch of functions and so <clears throat> what we were actually doing with this notation was calling a function now in some languages depending on the context sometimes they're called functions sometimes they're called procedures in some old languages I'm sorry not procedures methods they're called methods and then in some old languages they're even called procedures and they make the distinction between a function and a procedure for our purposes they're all the same right modern languages don't really make a distinction between a function and a procedure it's all the same it's just you can call it a function when you're talking about object-oriented <coughs> programming languages sometimes they're called methods even though the keyword is still function okay the keyword these are keywords uh, these are things that the language the computer language that we're using to program um, it means something in that computer language right so the function keyword means something the for keyword means, means something the let keyword means something the while etc etc okay so function is a keyword and what we were doing when we were invoking uh, that's another word invoking these methods we were calling another piece of code you know we're basically what the computer does is inserts you know move forward well where does it move forward oh it comes here and then it inserts this piece of code in there okay and then we were doing an alert which kind of triggered our browser to you know pop up a window that we were seeing last time right and you if you haven't seen lecture one I encourage you to do it to go see it in YouTube okay it's over there but um, anyways so it's, it's the same thing it's very similar to our function our main function right its function move forward and then you have some parentheses notice that when you invoke it you just say move forward and then you end your line with a semicolon right but notice that you don't put a semicolon in here okay it's only when you're finishing like a statement or a, an invocation or a call like this one I am making a call to turn right then I ended with a semicolon. I'm making a call to move forward. I ended with a semicolon. I'm specifying a variable here, and we'll we'll see what variables are next time. But I ended with a semicolon. But notice that when you say function, you don't end this line with a semicolon. When you say while loop, you don't end this line with a semicolon. When you say for loop, you don't end this line with a semicolon. So semicolon is almost like a period in the English language, right? And the reason you don't end that end this with a semicolon is because you haven't you haven't finished the statement yet, right? In here in move forward, um, and I had this X as an example before. Let me delete this. In move forward, like you know, I want you to call this, and then and then you're done. You know, it's almost like saying in English, move forward, and then you put a period in there right and when you're just writing English or any language right if you put a period it's like stop that's what the semicolon means right but if you just say if stop that that's like invalid right the, you haven't ended the definition of this if statement until you do all this right that's why there's no semicolon in here right that's kind of like the reasoning behind it right but again at this point don't get overwhelmed just flow with the notation okay. so going back to this this line doesn't have a semicolon because you know it kind of needs these right and so in this case the alert yes that's that's a that's a call I can end it with a semicolon because I'm saying just call that and I'm done with this line of code semicolon right but one of the important things that we said yesterday is like okay we need to write programs such that not only the computer understands but human other humans understands right and and when you get a job and you know maybe you go on vacation and somebody else needs to look at your code it's very important that your code is 
clean that you use the right name right last time we talked about what if I just call this X well that's a terrible name right or what what if I call it move forward but I turn right instead right well that's terrible code right so you need to choose the right names for your functions and your variables right but also you know this is a file right this lecture 2.js so it will help to put some comments at the beginning of this file right and we saw two ways to put comments slash slash which will ignore one line right so I can put some comments in here and then on the next line I need to put slash slash again right or another method if you're gonna do multiple lines is you started with a slash star right and this is gonna comment out everything until it finds another star slash kind of the reverse and everything in between these two things is gonna be a comment right so I can write as many lines as I want in here and everything is gonna be commented out right so comments are not executed by the computer comments are meant for humans right to read and to enhance the readability of your code. So what we can say in here is this code, this file, contains the code behind movement for the character. Yeah. And then the move forward function, we can do the same thing, right? Star slash or slash start, I'm sorry, right? So we can say in here, uh, moves the character forward one block, right? That's a good comment for this function, okay? And you can see in here, I already have um, comments for the rest of the functions, right? So basically this is, this is kind of you learning good habits of coding, right? comments at the beginning of the file, comments for every function that you write, right? And this looks much better than if it didn't have any comments. Okay? Let me just check real quick if there are questions. No questions, okay? All right. Um, so we talked about functions, we talked about comments. Um, sometimes you'll see this format in functions. So notice something in here. If I do slash and then two stars and hit enter, sometimes you'll see this notation. It's the same thing, right? What matters is this right here and this. Right. Again, everything in between doesn't matter if there are stars. You know, sometimes they keep putting stars in here. This is more for um, you know just making it a little bit prettier, so to speak, right? And so we can put this comment in here, and it'll be the exact same thing. Doesn't matter, right? So just so you know, right? You can do it this way, or you can do it. You you sometimes you'll see this. And this kind of triggers something called Javadoc notation. And in this case, it's not necessarily Javadoc because it's not Java, but Java was the first one, one of the first languages that invented Javadoc. But we'll get there when we get there, right? Don't worry too much about it. I just wanted you to see if you see this as kind of the same as this for our intents and purposes. Okay. All right. Um, let's continue. So we did more software engineering, good comments, good names, very important. Let's talk about decomposition. So going back to the puzzle, right? Um, when you have a problem in front of you, um, you, um, have to decompose it into smaller parts such that you can solve that smaller part or you can solve those parts one part at a time basically right so one example of this is that if somebody asks you okay well simulate what you do in the morning right let's write a simulation program of what you do in the morning so tell me what you do in the morning 
most people are going to say, oh, well, I wake up, you know, I brush my teeth, then I take a shower, then I put my clothes on, then I have breakfast, right? And it's very easy for us to think on those terms on the, at, the, at that level, right? If somebody just asks you, what did you do this morning? Uh, you know, you can just say, yeah, sure, you know, I did this one, two, three, and we're all good, right? But sometimes how specific you are is not the way a computer um, understands, so to speak, right? So again, just going back to decomposition, how would you decompose this? Well, if we just take brush teeth, right? You might decompose brush, brush teeth and then you can ask a dentist this, right? So, you know, you get the toothpaste, right? And then you put the toothpaste in that step one, just get the toothpaste, right? You cannot brush your, your teeth without toothpaste, or you can, but you know, it's not recommendable, right? So you get some toothpaste, you put the tooth, toothpaste on the toothbrush, you move the toothbrush up and down on your teeth, right? And then Dennis would get really like, oh, you need to do it in circular, you know, circular motion for your blah, 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 you know, up and down, whatever, right? You, you can get very detailed on the instructions. But you get the point, right? We just started with, hey, there's all these steps. So let's just take brush teeth, right? And let's decompose it into even smaller parts, right? That's what decomposition is, right? And we, what we just did here is what is called a top-down design, okay? Now, here's what the professors at the Ivy League school would tell you. They would tell you, oh, you know, Inexperienced programmers start with bottom-up design and then it takes them like two years to start thinking of top-down and that's the way you should do it. You should always do top-down. But I kind of disagree with that. Um, I, I think that sometimes you just got to do it bottom-up and sometimes you it's, it's easier to do it top-down. It's just what the situation calls for, right? There's no right or wrong. Okay, and that's one of the pet peeves I've got with some of these universities, and even my own alma mater. Right when when I when I went there, you know, you get indoctrinated to a certain point, and then you get told, "Oh, this is the right way of doing things." Right, and then you go out and graduate, uh, graduate, and then have jobs for twenty years, and then you look back and you said, "Yeah, those guys weren't that right." And so my word of advice, don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? It, it depends on the situation. But again, going back to the, these Ivy League professors, they will say, oh, top-down design is the, you know, the, the way you should do it. But it ta it'll take you two years to get there. That's what they say, right? But what's important here is that you understand, you know, top-down is you start with the bigger 30,000 feet view of, you know, what is my problem? And then you decompose it into smaller parts. So you know, big problem is what do you do in the morning? Oh, I do one, two, three, right? And then you grab one of those parts and okay, you brush your teeth. What does what does that mean, right? And then you decompose it even more, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's top-down decomposition. Okay. And so, with that in mind, we we're gonna write move backward, right? So. I have in here in the code, I have move forward, turn right, turn left, and that's it, right? So if I wanted to write move backward and I already have these functions, what could I do? Right, let's think about that for a minute, right? That's our puzzle, right? That's what programming is about. Our puzzle is we need to write move forward, or I'm sorry, move backward. So let's start doing that. We go down here to the end of the kind of like the, what the functions and how do we how do we do that? Okay, well function move backward begin end right now what? Oh, oops! If I can spell move backward. Okay, well what do I do now? Okay, well if you think about it, moving backward is I turn right two times or turn left two times, right? So if I'm facing east, I can face south and then west if I turn right two times or 
If I turn left two times, I would face west and then, I'm sorry, uh, north and then west, or south and west, right? So either way will work, right? So I'm just going to say turn right two times. And now when I do that, I'm facing the opposite direction that I was facing initially, right? Now what? Well, I can move forward, right? Move forward in the opposite direction, right? That's basically turn, move backward is move forward in the opposite direction if you think about it, right? So I just move forward. Okay, now what? Am I done? Well, not really, because you need to move backwards like a human though how you know you kind of like step backward right but in here because you kind of you're kind of faking it or you kind of like turning around moving forward but what do you need to do again well you need to turn around again to be facing the same direction where you started right and now we're done right Congratulations, we just did decomposition right, in our heads. Right? We started from the concept, okay, I, I understand what move backward means, but the only tools that I have in my box are these turn left and turn right and move forward. Right? They're already written. So how do I do move backward? Right? And we just did it. Right? Turn right two times, we're facing in the opposite direction, we move forward one step and then we turn right two times again right and these turn right could have, could have been turn lefts it doesn't matter right that is decomposition that is solving the puzzle okay and then for completeness we put some comments this will effectively move the character backward one step perfect we got the right name we got the right comments and we got the right code all right let's move on when should you stop decomposition um Again, decomposition is starting with a bigger problem and then start decomposing it until you have atomic uh, functions, right? Um, one line methods until, you know, so basically one suggestion would be, well, until you have a one line method. Um, if, in my opinion, if you have one line method, even though I just showed you one line methods, this is an alert, right? Um, this is kind of bad in the sense that, you know, I could have used this alert instead of the turn right, and it would still be one line in my original program, right? But in here, I am basically abstracting it and calling it something. If you just see alert, it's like, what does that, what does that even mean, right? But if you see a turn right or a turn left, then it means something. It's more readable, right? So that's the only... Um, time where I would say yeah one line methods are okay right if you're abstracting it and it's clearer and it's cleaner in the code but uh, you know you're making one more call which is more expensive to the computer which is gonna make your program slower so uh, you know I'm on the fence on that one right and for now it's okay right let's just learn the concept like you know until you get it to one line of code that's fine right but but again don't drink the kool-aid it's it's more nuanced than that and uh, we're gonna see you know how to make those calls later on but that's you know when should you stop decomposition all right let's move into something some more theory and and again I told you I was gonna bombard you with theory today but it's important next time we'll do a little bit more coding We'll do more hands-on, but all of this theory is important. Again, going back to one of the things that make me sad is that you know I, I see programmers out there and 
It's not that I want everybody to have a formal computer science degree, but the lack of knowledge on, on some of these basic things is concerning, to say the least. Right. So as you can probably tell already, I don't just want you to learn how to code and then just go out there and, and code. I want you to have some good background, some solid background, so that you can be the best programmer you can. Right? And this is for free. And then you can just go on YouTube and you can learn. And if you have questions, just ask questions on the chat. Okay, or on the YouTube comments. But okay, let's get into it. So computers only understands zeros and ones. You've probably heard this before, right? It's it's you know, even on <laughs> well, not on the matrix, but you know what I mean, right? You've seen a bunch of TV shows. It's all zeros and ones <laughs> moving uh, across the screen and stuff like that um, to represent how the what the computer understands. So basically, I'm I'm no electrical engineer, but you know it all boils down to electricity going through a transistor or not, right? No electricity is a zero. If there's electricity flowing through, it's a one, right? And then there's like billions of transistors, right? Basically. Uh, inside a computer chip, um, and that's what that's what that's what it is, right? That's what the computer does. That's what it understands. It's just all electricity flowing through or not, um, believe it or not. So this is called binary, right? Zeros and ones is called binary because there's two symbols, right? Binary notation. Bi means two, right? And so we refer to that as machine language. The zeros and ones that the computer understands is called machine language. Now here's a trick. It's chip chip dependent. What do I mean by that? Well, you've heard of Intel chips, right? And you've heard of probably ARM chips and the, the new Apple chip, right? And there's, there's like chips galore, right? And there's always been multiple chips, right? Well, the zeros and ones that Intel chips understand are not the same zeros and ones that an ARM chip understands on your phone more than likely right it's not the zeros and ones that um, you know the Apple chip understands furthermore I would even go as as far as saying when we get into executable files the zeros and ones in a Mac right are not the same as the zeros and ones in Windows and are not the same as the zeros and ones in Android etc etc right so if you don't believe me, take an execu a Windows executable, just grab that file, put it on a Mac, and double click on it and see if it runs. Right? It will obviously not run. Right? So it's sometimes, again, when it comes to executables, it's not only chip dependent, but it's also operating system dependent. Right? Every operating system has its rules on how it wants those zeros and ones. Right? But to kind of abstract from that, we have invented what we call high-level languages, right? And the first high-level languages, you can go back to, I think, Fortran, COBOL, and you name it, all the modern ones, right? And by, by modern, I mean Swift and all those. But even before that, you know, Java, C, C++, they're all high-level languages, right? Relatively modern languages. Um, Okay, and so we don't program in zeros and ones. No one does, right? Um, there are some people who program in assembly, which is like one level of abstraction up up from the zeros and ones, and they do that when they want to be extremely, extremely fast on the chip, right? So they adapt to the zeros and ones, and they're adapting to the chip and the operating system, and they do that because they want to squeeze the last microsecond out of some execution time on that program, right? And that again is called assembly. But most people don't write code in assembly. Most people write code in high level languages, right? Even if it's a super old one like Fortran. Okay. All right. So now the translation between a high level language to machine language to the zeros and ones is called compilation. Compilation. And it's done by a compiler. So what is that? You translate from a high-level language, C, C++, Java, C-sharp, Swift, into 
Um, well, Swift is a bad example, and Java is also a bad example, but we'll get there. Bear with me here. Um, machine language is called compilation and is done by a compiler. And as a programmer, you write source code, right? So all this code that we've written, for example, this is all called source code. This is your source code. This is what we write. We call it source code. Okay. All right, so on compiled languages, here's a caveat, right? Why, why I said Java is a bad example, C Sharp is a bad example, um, Swift and all the modern ones are a bad example because compiled languages are kind of old languages um, nowadays. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are some new languages that are coming out like Jai that are going to be, that are compiled languages. Go is another example of a quote unquote relatively modern um, computer language that is that is compiled okay and so again C, C++ um, they're all compiled languages so how does it look like well you write this source file right like we were writing before like you know main print hello world and then you give it to the compiler and the compiler creates the zeros and ones we usually call this file the object file and then we already said the zeros and ones of Windows are not the same as the zeros and ones of Linux or Mac. We already said that, right? But don't worry about that for now, right? So compiler compiles your source code into zeros and ones, object file. And then usually what happens is that your code is dependent on a whole bunch of other code, whether you realize it or not. Sometimes you specifically are using what we call libraries um, and libraries are nothing else than code written by written by someone else right so for example if you're using the math library right you don't want to reinvent how to compute sine and cosine and absolute value and all that right that that's already written for you in most languages they, all languages have a math library basically right you don't want to reinvent the wheel in that one right so you just use the sine and cosine that the language provides, right? But that usually lives in another file, right? And that's what we call libraries, right? So those files, sometimes you explicitly, you know, say something like import, and we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll see how we explicitly call libraries in some of these languages. But for now, just know that more often than not, you'll have some other files that you use it whether you realize it or not and the linker is what puts all of these zeros all, all of these files together and then informs an executable file okay and it's also zeros and ones that's how compile languages work compile languages C C++ Go uh, Jai is a modern one that's still not out it's gonna be out soon hopefully but uh, it's a compiled language, right? Um, and compiled languages are fast, right? Because, well, well, we'll see in a minute why, but these zeros and ones are what actually execute on the, on the chip, basically, right? There's a little bit of operating system monitoring how these zeros and ones execute, but for the most part, it's, it's as fast as it gets, believe me. All right, so there's a difference with interpreted languages, and I have interpreted in quotes in here because some people would say, oh, Java is not interpreted, or how dare you, you know, oh, Python is interpreted, but Java and C Sharp are, and blah, blah, blah. Well, this is my definition of interpreted. Most modern languages follow this convention, okay? And by modern, I don't necessarily mean better, okay? And this is this is what I want you to have to take with you and what I want you to have as context, right? So again, don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? Uh, when somebody comes in and is like, oh, Python is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that, right? Or Swift is, you know, it's the next thing and it's modern and it's oh, whatever, you know, I hate boomers or whatever. And not really, right? Um, you, you <laughs> again, this is, it, it's, it's the, um, the advent of the internet right like you just hear your own echo and people don't have context anymore and it's just sad okay it is just sad and it's one of the things 
I'm going to keep banging on. Um, my goal is to give you, open your eyes to the realities out there, all of them, right? And then make you choose, right? If in the end you choose an interpreted language because you think that's the best thing, then great, right? But at least you know what it is and what the pros and cons are, etc. Anyways, I digress. So, you know, in interpreted languages, um, what I mean by that is something like Java, C Sharp, Swift, most of the modern languages follow this convention. So they do have a compiler which translate not to machine code, not to zeros and ones, but to some intermediate language. Right? In the case of Java, for example, they're called class files. It's called bytecode, I think. Um, in the case of C Sharp, I think it's called IL, which IL stands for intermediate language, if I'm not mistaken, or CIL or something like that, common intermediate language. Anyways, some intermediate language, right? And then you also have a linker, right, with some other files, but these aren't the zeros and ones that are going to run in the computer, right? This linker comes up with some archive, right, of zeros and ones. Not that the operating system and the chip understand, but that a virtual machine understands. So what is a virtual machine? Because that's a fancy name, right? And again, I just said most modern languages, starting from Java, right, and then C Sharp was next, and then Swift, and then all the new ones, right, have this virtual machine concept. So what is that? Well, virtual machine is nothing more than an executable file in your computer, right? And yes, it might be an executable file that is, again, going back to the assembly that I was referring to last time, like, is, is tweaked so that it runs as fast as it can, but again, it's just another executable on your machine, right? So in Java, it's called the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM, right? And C Sharp is some other thing, whatever, right? There's, your code is not running on the chip, is running by, a com, by another program, is being interpreted by a program that runs on your machine. And then that program kind of runs on the chip, right? Or on the, you know, on the computer hardware, right? So there's this layer of abstraction, and this layer of abstraction has a cost, has a performance cost, right? And that is why languages like Java and C Sharp and Swift are usually, not even usually, like almost 100% of the time, they're slower than compiled languages because you have one extra interpretation step. There are some languages like Python that take this to the extreme. Python doesn't even compile anything. Like it just interprets your text file, right? The virtual, the Python virtual machine, so to speak, interprets your text file. Like it doesn't even compile into an intermediate language. It just interprets your step, your your um, text file. I'm sorry, your source code, right? And runs it. And if you remember last time. You know, I was kind of alluding to this, like, oh, cool, we don't need semicolons, and we don't need, you know, we don't even need a main function. It just runs. It's magical, right? Well, you pay with performance, right? All that is, your text file is being interpreted. Every line is being interpreted by a program, and that is slow. The more interpretation there is at this level, the slower, right? Now, this intermediate language usually is something that is neither like a source code text file, it's, it's very close to machine code, right? And therefore, this virtual machine interprets it and it interprets it usually very, very fast because it's just, just one step away from being true machine code. Now, what was the, in the beginning, what was the main uh, drive to invent this virtual machine languages like Java. Well, one of the main drives was, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I just write a source file and I compile it to this intermediate language, but then I can take this intermediate language, this interpretable archive, right? I just have to only compile once. And then the same archive would run on Windows and it would run on Linux and it will run on Mac. 
the exact same zeros and ones, right? So remember what I just told you a while back, right? Like I told you, take an executable in Windows, a .exe, put it on a Mac and double click on it, or right? like in a Mac that you don't even double click, whatever it is what, that you do to run, right? Um, it's not gonna run, obviously, right? The, Mac is not gonna understand those zeros and ones. It's gonna say, what the heck, right? However, if you take a Java program, right? A jar file is usually this archive is a jar file, and then you run it on a Mac, it's gonna run. You take a jar file, given that you have the, this Java virtual machine installed, right? Remember, you gotta have this virtual machine installed on your computer, because that's what's gonna interpret it. But anyway, so I was saying, take it on a Mac, same zeros and ones run on a Mac, on Linux, on Windows, on a toaster, on a phone, everywhere, right? That was the main drive with, with, with these languages, right? And that's great, right? You wanna run everywhere? Run everywhere, that's, that's great. Java is used on, Jesus, on everything, you know, toasters or whatever, right? We used to, uh, you know, I used to see when you download the latest or whatever, maybe the banner is still there, but when you download Java and you install Java, there, there used to be a banner that said, Java runs on three billion devices worldwide. And I believe that. I think it's more now, right? Why? Because of this, right? Because it's just, you know, it's it's easier to compile the zeros and ones and then you just take those zeros and ones and then there's virtual machines for everything. There's virtual machines for the toaster and your computers and Linux and Windows and Mac and everything. That was the main drive, right? So that is an advantage. I don't want you to, to not, you know, demonize you know, interpreted languages, right? There was a drive, there is a purpose for them, right? Um, but you pay with it, you pay in performance, right? So what is the opposite? So going back to compiled languages, so how do you do it such that it, it works on a Mac and it works on Linux? Well, if you wanted to work on Windows, you compile, you use the Windows compiler, right? You need to compile and then boom, Windows executable. If you want it to run on a Mac, you have to do the Mac compiler, right? So you compile it, and then the zeros and ones are different for the Mac, remember, right? And then you come up with a Mac executable. You want it to run on Linux, you take your source code. The source code doesn't change. Your code doesn't change. Your code is the same. But the compiler is a program that you need to download it. Down, I'm sorry, download, right? And then it'll compile different zeros and ones depending on the operating system and on the machine that you're running on, right? So every time you want to create an, executor, an executable for a new OS or a new uh, chip architecture, you need to recompile. Okay. All right, we kind of spent a lot of time there, but you know, I, I hope I hit the, the point home. Okay. All right, we're almost done with the stream here. I, I want to rate, oh, that nerd. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time, but the last concept I want to talk about is this concept of object-oriented um, languages, right? So in the beginning, there was just like things like Fortran and C and Pascal and all these old languages. They were called procedural. Now there's another realm of programming called functional programming. I, I won't go there, but you know, after procedural programming, which was kind of like the mainstream programming back in the day. Um, in the 80s, uh, Bjorn Straustrup, who created C++, well, some people debate it wasn't him, it was something, whatever. C++ was the most uh, ubiquitous object-oriented language used after C, probably. Um, but anyways, back in the 80s, Bjorn Straustrup created C++, and in his head, he had these, these concepts, the concept of object-oriented, right? And then after C++, Java copied the, the same concept, C Sharp, Python, you name it. All of the modern programming languages, Swift, they're object-oriented languages. Another parenthesis here. When I went to college, um, one of the Kool-Aids that I drank, right, one of the things that they told me is object-oriented is the way to do it, right? And it's the best, not only the best way, is the way you should do it. That's what they taught me, right? They also taught me, and I'm kind of dating myself, that waterfall, and we'll, if you don't know what waterfall is, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll get to it. But they taught me that waterfall, um, 
um, you know, uh, life cycle for software was the best thing, right? They told me things like, oh, you can do nine months of documentation and three months of coding and you'll come up with the best code ever. Well, nowadays, we know that's a fallacy. We know that is just completely wrong, okay, completely wrong. What am I trying to get at? Um, don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? So don't believe object-oriented is the best way of programming and it's the only way of programming. It's a way of programming, right? And if you have a situation in which, you know, this is just a tool in the toolbox, right? If you have a situation where this might be the, the best tool, then use it, right? But don't drink the Kool-Aid like I did when I after I graduated from college because they taught me it's like, you know, this is the best way to do it. This is the way you should do it. And a lot of colleges still do that. And again, you graduate, you go work as a programmer and architect and what have you for 20 years. And you look back and you said, oh, oh, shoot, I was wrong. Right. Um, that that was not and not only it's not that you were wrong. It, it, you have a little bit of resentment towards your professors, right, because they told you to drink the Kool-Aid. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, I want to teach you about object-oriented languages, but again, we're going to go into it with a, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. All right. So the concept behind object-oriented was, wouldn't it be cool if we could think about Going back to the decomposition, how do we think about things in the real world? Well, we think about things as a car, an airplane, a phone, a desk, a door. What are those things? Oh, they're objects, right? So wouldn't it be cool if we could somehow abstract into how our brain works? Our brain thinks in objects, right? And so wouldn't it be cool if we can start making the computer obey us by somehow following this, you know, our way of thinking, which is in objects. And that's kind of like the, in a nutshell, the, the spirit of object-oriented, right? We can get into a lot of arguments on the details and how that got implemented, blah, blah, blah. But that was kind of like the, the drive behind it, right? I won't go too deep into it other than, you know, an object, all object-oriented languages have something called classes. A class is an encapsulation of some behavior and data. What does that mean? It, it, it means there's something that is going to be called a class. So let me go back to code. All right, so for now, class in some of these languages is going to be a reserved keyword. And then I'm going to have something like class car, right? Class car. Uh, not not character car all right and this is pseudocode this is not valid code in JavaScript but bear with me here and that car is gonna have some um, it's gonna have like four wheels so maybe for the sake of example we're gonna do wheel one is gonna be a variable a variable and we're, we'll see variables next time but bear with me here wheel one and then Another variable, wheel two, and it's going to have uh, an engine. You get the point, right? And then it's going to have methods that kind of are related to the car. So one method, for example, or method or function, right? It's going to be start. You're going to start the car, right? And then we're going to do something about, right? Um, maybe stop. Right. Um, maybe break. How, how about just break? Right. It's going to be one function. Right. And then we're going to put some code here. Obviously, right. Bum bum bum. Obviously, we want some code here and here as well. And then we're going to do another function. You get the idea, right? Function accelerate. You get the idea. So all these methods or functions, along with the data, are kind of bundled into this whole thing called car. Right? 
So the car has methods and variables, sometimes called attributes, right? and it's all bundled together into this class. That's what a class is. Right, so encapsulation of behavior and data. Behavior are the methods or the functions, data are the variables. And we'll see more about variables next time. Furthermore, classes can have hierarchies, right? So sometimes this hierarchy is called inheritance. You inherit uh, from your parent uh, class some variables, for example. And I, I won't go too deep into this today, but just, you know, the concept that I want you to go away with is that classes have hierarchies. And then an object, right, it's object-oriented, it's not called class-oriented, it's called object-oriented. Well, an object is an instance of a class. What does that mean, right? A lot of programmers, especially when you're beginning, have a problem distinguishing between an object and a class. And believe it or not, in some of the in some interviews, but back in the day, well, not that long ago, they will ask you, what's the difference between a class and an object, right? And some potential candidates wouldn't know the answer, okay? So now you know a class is kind of like a template. Uh, you know, it's code, a template code, and then an object is an instance of that class. What does that mean? Well, let's go into this example. You know, I have a circle. Uh, a circle is a shape. I have a triangle. A triangle is also a shape. In this case, shape is a superclass. This is a is a relationship. A triangle is a shape. A circle is also a shape, right? So this arrow right here is called an is a relationship, right? And this is called a superclass, and this is called a subclass. Let's leave it leave it at that, right? Sometimes this relationship is called inheritance. Circle inherits from shape. Triangle inherits from shape. And we'll go in deeper into inheritance later on. But to drive my instance point home, let's say you're writing a program that draws shapes on the screen, right? Well, circle is the code that is kind of like the template on how to draw a circle on the screen, right? So how do you draw a circle on the screen? Well, it's got to be round, like perfectly round, right? It's going to have a radius, and then it's going to have a position on the screen, probably an X and Y, right? Some position on the screen, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You get the point, right? So the code that are kind of like the instructions on how to draw a circle, one circle, that's going to be the class, right? But then guess what? I want to have ten circles on the screen. So what I'm going to do is instantiate the class ten times. Do I ha did I have to write 10 times the amount of code? No, I just had to write the code once, right? The code is how to draw a triangle, on, I'm sorry, a circle on the screen. That is the code, right? Just once. But I can instantiate multiple circles on the screen. I can have 100 circles on the screen, right? And each one of those 100 circles would be an instance of that class. In other words, it would be an object. At the end of the day, if I have a hundred circles on the screen, I would have a hundred circle objects. Right? And so an object is an instance of a class. Right? Each one of those hundred circles, instance of the circle class. Circle class, just the instructions on how to draw one circle on the screen. All right, uh, next time we're gonna see more about variables. Um, we're gonna do, hopefully we'll start doing some fun stuff, drawing on the screen, writing some code on JavaScript to draw on the screen. I know this was a lot of theory. Again, my goal is to give you a formal, good, solid education, similar to Ivy League level computer science, computer, you know, CS 101 class to start with and we'll go through a lot of you know I, 
I won't stop. I, I will just go on, right? All of this is going on YouTube and is staying on YouTube for posterity. Um, but um, we'll keep on at it. Uh, hopefully next time we'll do more hands-on, more coding. Um, sorry this took so long and sorry this was a lot of theory, but um, it was important. All right, so thank you very much for uh, being here. Let me just check if we have questions. Um, I don't think we have questions. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to rate someone, and I want to rate O.Nerd. Uh, is O.Nerd here? O.Nerd, come on. Yeah, he's there. All right. Thank you, guys. See you later.